Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about our work and how our team, which is a collaboration between MGH Surgery and MIT CSAIL, is working to develop artificial intelligence for use in the operating room. Intraoperative adverse events are, in their simplest form, um, adverse events or inadvertent injuries that occur throughout the course of an operation. This is typically to major structures like bowel or vasculature, major arteries and veins. And 440,000 of these are estimated to occur each year in the U.S. alone. And that's a conservative estimate. And that's a problem because adverse events have consequences. Cost, for example. We know that a patient who has an IAE has, a 41 uh, has an, on average a 41% higher cost of admission. But there are also patient consequences. I actually recently took care of a patient who was undergoing a laparoscopic gallbladder removal and unfortunately uh, had an injury of the common bile duct, so was transferred to MGH for further management. And this was meant to be a one-hour case, a same-day surgery, go home. But with this injury, this patient ended up with a large incision, a reconstruction of the bile duct system by rearranging her intestines. And what was meant to be a same-day hospitalization turned into a two-week hospitalization with significant long-term follow-up. So there are consequences for patients, too. But it's hard to study intraoperative events. In medicine, we've done a pretty good job of understanding preoperative and postoperative variables that can contribute to complications. But the intraoperative phase of care remains a bit of a black box. And that's because the knowledge of what happens in the operating room is largely siloed in the mind of the individual surgeon that was operating or in the institution where that patient was cared for. So, what we know is that if we want to look at, to see what happened in a case, you got to look at the operative report. And operative reports are at best incomplete and at worst inaccurate. A study conducted a couple of years ago in Holland looked at a year's worth of laparoscopic video and their corresponding operative reports. Only 27% of the operative reports reported an iatrogenic injury that had been seen in the video. That's valuable data that can help to diagnose a postoperative complication. So for the last four years, our team has been asking ourselves, how can we access some of this data that's happening in the operating room, and, and can we access in a quantitative way so that we can make it readily available for real-time clinical decision support? So we developed something that we are calling a surgical fingerprint. We take real-time computer vision and combine it with probabilistic modeling. We use tools like neural networks, hidden Markov models, some additional proprietary algorithms. And what this system does is it watches a video in real time. And it analyzes each frame and determines which step of an operation is occurring. And then, based on a previous pool of analyzed data, determines whether deviations are occurring from a statistically expected operative course. Take case A on the left. This is a straightforward laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. On the y-axis is the steps of the operation. On the x-axis is time. In the red, you can see that the steps of the operation proceed in a pretty straightforward manner. But compare that to case B on the right. Already visually, you can see that there's a difference. The case doesn't proceed in a very straightforward linear manner. In fact, you see in the yellow and the green and the light blue, those are low probability events that are occurring. And because this analysis is happening in real time, it can provide feedback to the surgeon right then and there. Furthermore, that data can get kept in a database to inform the system moving forward to help it detect the deviation sooner next time. We've tested this now on a little over 60 laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomies, and we have an accuracy rate of over 92% in correctly identifying the steps of the sleeve gastrectomy. In fact, when we take examples and we compare it to a group of expert bariatric surgeons, the way that they identify steps is in light green, and the way the machine does is in blue, and we get pretty high concordance. In addition to sleeve gastrectomy, we're also currently looking at laparoscopic cholecystectomy or gallbladder removal, and an endoscopic example in peroral endoscopic myotomy. We think this technology has the potential to benefit multiple stakeholders across the health system. Of course, patients are gonna benefit if they have a reduced risk of complications. Surgeons benefit. I'm a surgeon, I love data, and I want extra data to help me make better decisions to take care of my patients. And hospitals and payers benefit because the operations become more efficient and the lower likelihood of complication reduces cost. So as an example for where this could go in the future, think surgeon A performing a cancer resection. 
They get in the abdomen and they realize that the normal anatomy has been skewed by the cancer. The surgical fingerprint system, analyzing this in real time, realizes something's not quite right, looks at the database and says, oh, actually, Surgeon B, somewhere else across the world, came into this very similar situation. And so is then able to provide Surgeon A with additional data. What are potential next steps that occur? What are the potential anatomic no-go zones that could lead to complications? What we're talking about is sharing operative data in real time in a quantitative manner for real-time clinical decision support. This is like ways for surgery, but instead of avoiding traffic, will help you avoid complications. This is big data yielding personalized medicine for the surgical patient. Now, we've had some advantages that allowed us to make a lot of this progress. Number one, I think being in Boston, we've been able to collaborate with a great team across the river from us at MGH. Uh, in particular, Professor Daniel LaRousse, who's the director of the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT CSAIL. She's been a big partner in this, and her team includes leaders in real-time analysis of massively streaming data sets which is how we're able to take in so much data and compute so quickly. This is all work that they've actually gathered a lot of it from working on autonomous cars. So now we see an intersection of two types of te technologies coming together to improve the health of our population here in Boston. We also focus mainly on context-based segmentation. So a lot of other groups have focused on, oh, can I identify the instrument to figure out what part of the operation is happening? Not all surgeons have the same preferences, and we don't all like to use the same instruments. So our analysis is robust against surgeon preference. And we're able to do this in real time to provide this kind of feedback. And other groups have required 24 to 36 hours of post hoc analysis to achieve similar results in accuracy. We use a technology called core set compression to compress our data so that we can look at massive amounts of data in a short amount of time. And we use active learning to reduce our annotation needs, which really puts us in a good position to scale. And we've taken the initial appropriate steps to begin to secure the intellectual property surrounding this work. So to recap, where are we? Well, we have real-time identification of the phases and steps of an operation. And based on statistical modeling, we're able to detect when a deviation is occurring from an expected operative course. And we're able to do this because we have a large volume of surgical data at the MGH on which we can learn from. But detecting deviations isn't enough. Our goal is to predict and prevent the complication before it ever occurs. And this is one of the things that we're working on right now. Furthermore, it's not just about the intraoperative phase of care. How can we take events in the intraoperative phase of care, think about what the patient's preoperative risk factors were, and use those two in combination to predict postoperative events? And actually, earlier this month, we received word that we had been, received a large grant from CRICO, which is our malpractice carrier, to do just this with our technology. But we're going to keep pushing, and, we, and we're going to develop more. And one of the things we want to do is really expand to other operations, more complex operations with higher morbidity and mortality, laparoscopic liver resection, for example, or colon resection. We also need to work on developing a user interface. What we have now is great for scientists and researchers, but we want to develop a system that maximizes utility for the surgeon in the operating room while minimizing distraction. And of course, we're eventually going to need to run a prospective study to really demonstrate the efficacy of this system in reducing complications and intraoperative adverse events. Our goal here is to help pool decision making and experience across many different surgeons. What we want to do is we want to bring the decision making capabilities and the surgical techniques of many surgeons of the global surgical community into every operating room. It's about building a collective surgical consciousness that can provide real-time clinical decision support for the benefit of our patients. Thank you.